Thanks, Dominic, and thanks for the amazing organisation of this conference. I'm really being challenged to think through some new ideas with relation to my work. I'm sure you all are, um, so that's really helpful. So, um, here are the themes that I'm going to be raising in my talk today. This one, I hope, is really obvious to you, that facts and social epistemology are mutually constitutive. That's a standard insight from Shapin, and I hope that's a, a launching off point that we can all go from. Bu building on from that, I want to argue that facts and futures are also mutually constitutive, at least in some cases, and that narrative is the medium in which both of those can be mutually constituted, that, that that is the space in which we can do that. And finally, I want to introduce an idea of the engineer's plot. So um, riffing off of Dominic's very helpful list of terms that he passed out this morning, emplotment, I think, is probably the one that's closely related to this talk, perhaps also heuristic fiction. Um, and I'm going to present that as a contender for a useful mode of climate narrative in particular. So, good news, everyone. Uh, power stations, carbon dioxide, bad, but uh, fantastic news. Uh, we can suck the carbon dioxide out of those and make it into sugar. There is literally sugar in the air. Da da, the big reveal. It's, in fact, a plot device from a 1930s novel. How about that? Um, this is the novel, it's called Sugar in the Air, and it's written by a man called E.C. Large, and happily this photograph was taken in the same year that the novel was published, 1937, there he is smoking a cigarette that's actually compulsory for writers in the 1930s. <laughs> Large was from a comfortable middle class background, but he didn't follow the, the track of going into high science that a lot of people did from that generation. He converted to, to what he very much saw as the honest, good, honest, down-to-earth virtues of engineering. And his training followed the model that was a, um, available to people from much less comfortable backgrounds than his own. He trained at Battersea Polytechnic and through evening study. And this created in him a very deep sympathy with the engineering approach to science, the kind of people who accessed science in that way and practiced science in a slightly different way. And in Sugar in the Air, there's quite a few passages um, that reflect this. It's a semi-autobiographical novel. In the poly, there was no collegiate stuff, no swanking and old school ties. It was a place where they had worked like the devil for years and years and years. They had had to earn their living at the same time. Whilst the day student at King's College, let's just leave it there, could lounge in blazers, play tennis and flirt on the river, they had for their lightest recreation problems in entropy and differential calculus. After his study, his first job was in coal with the coal pioneer Rudolf Lessing, um, who was uh, well known in his day for doing a number of things with coal and cleaning up coal and that reference to coal tie yesterday uh, was a very helpful one for me actually. Large lost his job due to the crash in 1928. He was unemployed for a year and a half and he basically taught himself to write during that time. Uh, but he didn't start work writing Sugar in the Air quite yet. In 1930 he worked for a colloidal chemist company in Acton and there he helped to develop a fungicide which was ultimately bought out by Boots in 1936. So this is a much later uh, uh, leaflet from it, for it from the 1960s, but it's just nice to see a little bit of material culture around that. That fungicide was called Buisol. There was another closely alloyed product called Solsol, and they're very clearly part of the model for the product that is called Sun Sap in Sugar in the Air. I'll tell you more about that novel in a second, but we'll just go on with large for now. During World War II, he converted his work in fungicides to the science of mycology. So it's a really interesting career. Starts in engineering, uh, then industry, and then sort of into quote-unquote proper science. Um, it may well have been a pacifist manoeuvre to avoid being called up to get into something that was obviously to do with protecting British agriculture. So uh, this is the, the wonderful science fiction cover for a history of um, plant pathology, 
um, and, and in, in relation to fungi that he wrote or published in 1940. And um, it's, it's interesting and significant because of the way that it narrates science. So it's very interesting to read alongside Sugar in the Air as a non-fiction version of, of narrating science. He always took an engineer's approach to everything that he did. He called these his engineering drawings of toadstools. Um, and this is an example of one of them. And he also graphed out his progress in, in his writing of his novel. It's literally a graph. He shows you how he goes through chapter by chapter. He's got a real engineer's mindset going on. But at the same time, you can see that he's really seduced by high modernism, both in science and in literature. Um, Sugar in the Air and the book, that f the fictional book that follows it, are um, in some ways sort of social realist, but, but also they, there's an incredibly um, complicated sort of metafictional thing going on, particularly in the second novel that makes you completely reread the first novel. So he is sort of seduced by that. And um, there are moments where the semi-autobiographical character, Pry, uh, is is tempted by the sort of the idealism of science uh, and there's unfortunately no time to go into the details of that. I think even the name of that character Pry is is an interesting one. Um, to pry is to look into the secrets of nature. It sounds quite Baconian although annoyingly when I googled Pry and Bacon I couldn't get anything <laughs> but it sounds Baconian right? Um, uh, but it's also just a simple lever, it's a, a simple engineering lever. Um, so the way in which Sugar in the Air balances that ideal of science and the pragmatism of engineering I think is one of its chief interests um, and in another article he's got this amazing uh, literary critical review of a piece of agricultural writing and, and he praises the kind of the clean purity of this just wonderful let's get on with it uh, as though it were the highest form of poetry. So I think the word that I want you to latch onto in relation to large and engineering is pragmatism, a really pragmatic attitude towards everything. So uh, Sugar in the Air, uh, well worth a read. Pry is taken on by this company who have sort of got a mechanism for capturing carbon dioxide from coal gases. Uh, or uh, power station gases and uh, turning it into sugar. They take him on not really thinking that this is actually going to work, but he actually gets it to work. It's the opposite of a success story. It starts with this sort of success and then it peters out. He's thwarted by the financial shenanigans of the owning company and the other stakeholders. He's forced to make excessive claims for its efficacy and for its future profitability. He is forced to cease research and focus on sales and ultimately um, even though the science has sort of has succeeded in one sense the, pro the, the project fails and he's let, by, let go by the company and he doesn't even have the intellectual property rights for it. And um, as a social critique of science of course it reminds us of um, writers like Bernal who um, has a very um, strong critique of science and scientific knowledge um, as owned by capitalism and, and feels that it should be put to social good. And there's a very obvious resonance there. We can also note, I think, the mutable nature of SunSap within this plot. Um, it changes according to the climate. It's a scientific coup where only the principle, can you do it, is of interest. It's um, a scientific achievement to go from the principle to actually making uh, a useful quantity of the stuff. It's presented as or, or intended as an economically superior alternative to other foodstuffs, i.e. can you make it cheaper than growing uh, product out of the soil? Uh, is it nutritionally superior to sugar from other sources? Uh, Pry himself never believes that but he's forced to start claiming it and then eventually it's sold as a scientific spice to supplement other sugar-based products even though it's exactly the same thing chemically but because it's come from the sun it's sort of better. 
Pry identifies his friend Abner Muller in this amazing phrase, a transvaluer of values. So Muller is his friend, he's at the beginning of the story and he, he's responsible for a lot of Pry's intellectual development. Muller quietly demonstrated that there are no laws in nature, that facts are only notions widely accepted, and that matters of religion and philosophy are things more real than concrete and harder than chrome steel. Pry was greatly shocked and surprised. And I was just astounded when I read that because that just sounds like a very standard STS perspective. And there it is in a novel in the 1930s. Um, and Pry sort of aspires to this and he calls it being a transvaluer of values. And I just thought that was super exciting. Um, and it, again, it's a sort of an engineering concept. You know, you can. He feels that he can just, you know, he can have a go at, at, at figuring out what's really going on in economics or politics or how science works. Let's, let's have a go. It's uh, very much the engineering mindset, I think, in this novel. So, carbon narratives then and now. Um, there's obviously a huge difference. Uh, this is not a novel about carbon capture in anything like the modern sense because the problem now is excess and the problem then uh, was sufficiency. Um, and uh, he's writing in a context of economic deficit, um, looming wartime rationing. He's very interested in the Irish potato famine, of course, in his fungal book. So it's, it's a book about um, deficit rather than excess. But it's still worth considering as a model of transvaluation, what he calls transvaluation. Just as engineering gives us a different story about science, than the high science of private, and uni of, uh, of private laboratories and university laboratories. So this audacious claim to transvaluation might lend a different heritage and a different model to STS. Scientists are historically tangled up with questions about objectivity and distance and so on. The self-narration of engineers may be more productive to work with. It's all about pragmatism. As I was putting this talk together, I, I felt as though the news was sort of developing even f faster than the, the talk itself. I'll just show you a couple of slides. So Drax uh, claiming uh, that its pilot model to capture CO2 was working. Uh, we haven't got time to watch this video, uh, but I, I do urge you to do so in the name of fictional narratives. So this is about a massive facility uh, just off the coast of Rotterdam that's going to cut carbon emissions. Uh, and here we go, now we're, now we're really into large territory, turning carbon dioxide into cash and uh, plan to sell 50 million meals made from electricity, water and air. There we go. Um, planting trees as a, uh, as a way of capturing climate change and sort of inspired by, by large, I sort of went through the, the math on the back of an envelope here and found out how, how much uh, does a tree weigh uh, how much carbon is within that? How much do we consume per year? How many trees would we need to plant per year to capture that? And it comes out uh, that if we, if we did it, in 13 years we would have carpeted the entire UK in trees and we would have run out of capacity at that point. So we can do it for 6.5 years if we cover everything. Um, this is scary. So this is the Committee on Climate Change. This is their... Um, what was presented in the news as, a very, as being very critical of the government's um, progress in cutting carbon and the, the, the CCC um, headed by um, John Gummer, Lord Denham, saying you're, you're not doing well enough, you need to do better, you need to do it like this. When you read this report, the trajectory that they map out for carbon descent in the UK is largely based on carbon capture technologies that do not yet exist. So it's really, really frightening. Um, and people are starting to ask questions about narrative in public. So this is an article about how journalists are writing about global heating, um, no, the no unanimity about how to play it and, and how to avoid fatalism, despair, depression, and a sense of paralysis. Um, so why is the contemporary carbon narrative so difficult to compose? Well, obviously, the facts of carbon descent need social embodiment. Again, um, as a standard insight, we have to turn those data into facts by lending them social trust. They don't become real until we actually start doing the job. 
Secondly, the, psych the psychology of successful motivation um, tends towards the positive. There's lots of research that says if you give people a negative narrative, then they, then they don't um, engage with it. And we, you need an ending to, to bounce your plot against. And we don't have the ending for the carbon narrative at this point, uh, or at least not one that is happy and pragmatic. What is the big narrative? Is it success, disaster, or a thin thread of hope? It's probably somewhere between disaster and the thin thread of hope. It's going to be terrible, but we could make it slightly less terrible. Um, or there's a pragmatic narrative. There might, pl If there might plausibly be a risk, and if you could act to stop it being worse, why would you not? This is really problematic, I think, from a narrative point of view, the IPCC report, um, because what it... What we want it to say is, uh, if we do X, then it will be a happy ending. But it doesn't. It says 1.5 Celsius will be terrible, and here's how we achieve it. So I think that's part of the reason that, that we didn't quite know how to play that out in public. I think Extinction Rebellion is spinning it in a more successful ways, way. So just thinking a tiny bit more about plots uh, to finish. Uh, once we, when we mention plots in history, we obviously we think of Hayden White. Here's a summary. You'll recognise the font. It is, it is from Wikipedia. Sorry. Um, so we can we can think about uh, some of these plots in relation to our carbon narrative. So the romance one is that tech will save us. Uh, tragedy is the uninhabitable Earth. Uh, Comedy is, is perhaps uh, the sort of new denialist model that, you know, uh, the people will rebalance, we will adjust, uh, that kind of thing. Satire, which is sort of what sugar in the air is, it's hard to, well, it is, it's hard to satirise when one of the forces is non-human. So I think here's a question about agency, which is really important to, to narrative. Satire is essentially a humanist mode. Once we involve the gods, then irony is trans transmogrified into fate, always. So we hit a problem there. White was a high modernist in that he believed in the power of humans above all else. His aim in showing that history was a human construction was to release his readers from its thrall, to be free to act afresh. The carbon narrative doesn't have gods, but in its sheer implacability, carbon dioxide might as well just play that role. Nevertheless, the novel is a special realm, um, White approved of novels, in fact, in which the purely human can be explored, since, of course, within a novel, nature can be manipulated to the novelist's imagination. Though, of course, the reader can interpret it differently. In Sugar in the Air, the failure of science is entirely a human matter. In Advance of the Fungi, there's a cautious balance between the forces of nature and the forces of humanity. Large was already rejecting the view of science as the saviour of humankind within 60 or perhaps even 20 years of the creation <coughs> of that vision. At the end of Advance of the Fungi, um, Large moves towards poo-pooing this idea of the gene. What nonsense, he says. And the reason he thinks it's nonsense is an entirely pragmatic one. He thinks that um, it's being presented as the idea of a magic bullet. If we can find the gene for fungal resistance, we can pop it in and it'll all be fine. Um, so it's not a metaphysical, it's not a scientific rejection, it's a pragmatic one. And um, at the end of um, Advance of the Fungi, he does an interesting thing in narrative terms. He moves into the future to talk about the present as though it were the past. And that's a classic science fictional move in terms of narrative and if you're not alert to it you don't see that that's the switch he makes those who believed in genes postulated the existence of an eternal quality r which they could take from wild plants into cultivated ones and so make them disease resistant forever those who thought not in terms of mathematical abstractions but of the green flux of ever-changing nature saw no end to man's labors in defending the crops upon which he depended for life. Thank you. <laughs>